Hi, my name is Kathy King and I'm the director of the Harvard Ceramics Program. Here in Alston, we're just across the river from Harvard Square in the main Harvard campus. And we're a beautiful 15,000 square foot facility that serves both the Harvard and general community. Today, I'm gonna to give you a little introduction to the clays we use here in the studio and the clays that you could possibly use at home. So we're gonna start with what clay is and all clay is derived from granite. Granite is comprises 75% uh, of the earth's crust and over time when affected by wind, rain, riverways, uh, glacial movement, uh, this material is then pulverized and ground down and then it travels and picks up impurities along the way. This is a clay that uh, was found in the Boston area. If I walked right past this, I would just think it was a rock and it feels quite hard like a rock. If introduced to water, it will begin to start to slake down. And what that would leave us with is a material that hopefully has a quality which we call plastic. And so this is some porcelain in my hand right here. And as I roll this into a coil, what I want to do is then bend it. And if I start to see this clay just break apart or crumble in my hands, then I know that that's probably closer to some sort of soil or dirt. But if it does bend without breaking and then also reacts to the compression of my hand, taking on the shape of the pressure exerted on it, I know that I've got clay, which is great. So as we move on to different clay bodies, We'll walk through some of the different clay bodies that we have here in our studio. And there are many different recipes because clay is essentially a recipe. Uh, it is comprised of alumina and silica. And then uh, depending on its, how it was created, we get different characteristics. This clay here is terracotta. It looks very familiar to us if we've ever seen bricks or planters. Terracotta is plentiful and easy to find all across the uh, globe. Um, oftentimes, most of the earliest ceramic creations were made with some sort of terracotta or earthenware. And the reason for that is that deep red color comes from uh, the impurity iron. And iron is something that we also call a flux, and a flux lowers the melting temperature of alumina and silica, which is quite high. And therefore, we can fire it at much lower temperatures than other clay bodies. So this clay, which we're seeing in its raw form, in a form that we call bisque, which is kind of partially fired, and then this is an example of the terracotta in its fired form, and we would fire this clay to about 1060 Celsius, 1940 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a great uh, reason as to why we see so many early examples of work being created with earthenware because it was the easiest one to fire and have it uh, get to the point that it, it's at its strongest point and impervious to water. Now, as we move on, we're going to go into a body of uh, clays that are called stonewares. And stoneware um, is a temperature of uh, 1305 Celsius and 2381 Fahrenheit, so much, much higher. We're talking about uh, the same temperature range that iron melts. So within these clay bodies, what we're seeing is kind of a buff gray color. Uh, and then in this uh, brown stoneware, we start to see a little bit of a change in color. And then we have a body that is, uh, has something added to it to make it even stronger. If we look at the white and brown stoneware, uh, we can see the celadon glaze that's been applied to it after the clay was bisked or went through that first firing to make it a little bit easier to handle. I'm not gonna break this as easily, but it's still absorbent. So I can put this in a bucket of liquid glaze and have that then go into the firing. So this celadon looks very different depending on if it's on the white stoneware or the brown stoneware. 
And so if you think about it, this is almost like uh, artists deciding on how to prep their canvas. So the artist or designer wants to think about what is that base color that the glaze is going to react to. So we see here a very noticeable difference in the white stoneware versus the brown. And then we get into an even bigger difference between this brown stoneware and this clay, which is called T1 or a sculpture body. And the reason for that, if you can see the pattern system on this T1 is because an aggregate has been introduced to the clay body. And what that is, is something that has been added into the clay to give it um, a little tooth and strength during the building phase. This clay body, T1 or the sculpture clay, is the best uh, in terms of being able to withstand freeze or thaw. Um, specifically in the Boston area, we would really have to think about that if we were creating a sculpture that is meant to be outdoors or um, uh, let's see, or needs a little bit more strength. Let's imagine we have a figure that we're making and we need the arm to stand up. This clay is going to give that little extra tooth to it uh, for both texture and strength. Now we're moving on to uh, this clay body here. And this is of course one that you're probably familiar with, which is called porcelain. And porcelain is wonderful. It's very different than all these clay bodies over here. These terracotta and stonewares, these are referred to as secondary clays, and that's because in their formation, they somehow moved from that original uh, granite state, uh, again, with uh, glacial movement, riverways, wind, erosion, uh, something impacted these clays. Porcelain is derived from kaolin, and kaolin is born of its parent rock. It's born through compression rather than movement. So we can see porcelain has no impurities. It has that um, iconic white color. And then also you can see the lack of iron in this clay body really impacts both the clay color after firing, but a lot about the glaze. So this glaze on the white stone where we can see little speckles. And those speckles are essentially little bits of iron that are still in that clay body. Even though we call it white stoneware, there's still that degree of impurity. With the porcelain, we see nothing like that. We can also see that the glaze looks a completely different hue, value, and is really bright. So we wanna consider that porcelain is just truly fantastic in terms of um, being able to uh, be uh, created thin enough so that light can emit through it. It's the only clay that can do that. But the trick is that when you do that, it makes the clay very fragile. And porcelain is very tough to work with. We like to joke that it's almost like working with cream cheese because it also, uh, in addition to not having impurities, it has none of those aggregates inside of it. Therefore, it has very little to give it strength. So could we find any of these clays in say the local area? Sure, we could, especially around Boston, Cape Cod, there are deposits of um, mainly earthenwares. And this is a clay that was dug up around uh, in the island of Martha's Vineyard. And actually they don't let you um, dig clay out of the deposits there any longer because of dune erosion. But we can see here what uh, we would do if we were out in the wilderness searching for clay. We would get some, we would put it out into a patty or a little slab, and then we would create a 10 centimeter mark. And that 10 centimeter mark is what we're gonna measure as this clay goes from its raw state or green state. When the visible water begins to dry out from it, it's referred to as bone dry, and that's when clay is at its most fragile state but we also know that it's ready to put into the kiln. Once it comes out of the kiln, we wanna measure that 10 centimeter line again and determine what the rate of shrinkage is. So all clays have a rate of shrinkage and that's really important when you're trying to design um, with a clay body to know which clays um, uh, will shrink more than others. So something like this, which is very similar to our sculpture clay, has a lower shrinkage uh, rate at around 10%, whereas uh, clay 
that is derived of kaolin or close to <clears throat> uh, porcelain has a much higher shrinkage rate and which can be all the way up to 15%. So when we're uh, trying to work with say tiles that are going to interlock together, et cetera, we have to work in that rate of shrinkage to make sure that we get the best result. So let's talk about some of the clays that we can find mined uh, presently around the U.S. So what we have here are clay bodies that are uh, rich with iron. In this case, this is a um, mine that is called Red Art, Lizella, well, there's a Lizella, and then we have Barnard clay. So most of our clays are named after the mine. And then we start to see a lot of buff color here. These are mainly clays that will be in the recipe to create stoneware. If we want iron, we want, um, uh, say, the speckles that I showed you earlier, or we want that richer, toastier color after firing, we might add in some of these iron-rich clays. Uh, these are mainly mined in the southern U.S., uh, mainly in the Midwest, we start to see more of the stoneware clays. And then we have some kaolin uh, mines that we pull from. Uh, this one here is tile six, and this is a kaolin that we often use. But if you really wanna make beautiful porcelain, uh, you oftentimes need to import it. And this is English Grawley clay. And this is a, a kaolin that we will bring in to mix our own porcelain. If you remember, I talked about clay being comprised of both alumina and silica. And alumina, uh, or boron, is a material found in all clays, but it has a very high melting point, around 3,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Same with silica, or flint, which is our glass former. And Glass formers are wonderful specifically in the glaze stage when we're starting to take these same ceramic materials, add colorants, and then use this as a light coating on top of the clay surface that's then fired to a glass. So both of these being present in clay, um, we can't fire these in a normal kiln <laughs> or one that we would want to fire. So what we need to do is lower the melting point of these two materials found in clay so that we can uh, fire it in a more reasonable um, method. So this group of ceramic materials is what we refer to as fluxes. And these are all mined materials that are heavy in um, one of the following materials. Uh, lead. Lead is probably the most powerful flux, so if you added lead to a ceramic material, you would really lower the melting point and have to fire it at a low temperature. We then get into powerful fluxes such as sodium, potassium, um, barium, strontium, calcium, and as a clay mixer or a glaze mixer, we have to really be mindful of how much flux to put in it in combination with other materials to give us not only the characteristics that we want from a clay body or a glaze, but to be able to fire it in uh, the amount of time that we uh, find you know, comfortable and uh, to be smart about the amount of fuel we're using to fire the ceramic material. So, we can see that all the fluxes have different characteristics, just uh, melting them on their own. You can see some have different color properties. Uh, some are going to melt quicker than others. So these are all considerations as we uh, work with fluxes. In this section, we're talking about colorants, which are also fluxes. So uh, anything that has a good amount of colorant in it would most likely be able to lower the men melting temperature of the other ceramic materials as well. Here we see uh, derivatives of iron over here with a red and yellow iron oxide. We also have two different forms of cobalt and copper, both in an oxide and a carbonate form. Uh, the main difference being the particle size and the intensity of the color. So you just adjust um, one to the other uh, in terms of how um, 
intense you want the color to be. And then we have chrome, rutile, which is a titanium uh, base. And uh, then we have mason stain, which is not naturally mined, as all these others are. But instead, a mason stain is a company, Mason, that uh, creates a recipe that will make a color this vibrant, say this uh, kind of like electric blue color here. And that's done by uh, creating uh, fritz, which are uh, different recipe of ceramic materials, including fluxes that are then fired down into a glass, pulverized, and then brought back into the recipe. So colorants tend to be used for surface applications and not for uh, the clay itself. It is possible to color clay. Uh, if you've ever seen Wedgwood, uh, Wedgwood is a English potter uh, manufacturer who uh, added blue into a porcelain body and created a blue uh, clay. It's very expensive to do, so we tend to use these for surface applications. One of the earliest surface applications uh, would be what you might see in the um, a museum. And that would be something called terra sigillata. And here we have a replica piece of um, a Greek drinking vessel from the Harvard Art Museum. And this uh, clay here has been applied with not a glaze, even though we can see there's a shine to it, but it was applied with a uh, clay surface that has been specially prepared. And how that is done is to take uh, red clay, add it with water, as you can see in this uh, jug right here, and then we add a flux, which in this case is sodium, the sodium's not doing anything in the firing process in this case, but what the sodium's doing is dispelling the electrical attraction between the clay particles. And so we see the clay start to settle. It's hard to see, but some of the heaviest particles are located at the bottom of the jug right here. We have clear water at the top, so that has uh, risen to the surface. And then right in here is going to be a really lovely layer of very fine particled clay. Again, thinking about clay particles like roof shingles, how we um, can imagine them with uh, as roof shingles with like a layer of water between them. Now, this application here, this very smooth, thin colorant going onto the bone dry clay. So this is clay, very, very dry, fragile. And as this dries, what I'm going to do is take a cloth and begin to burnish it. And what I'm doing with the pressure from my hand and the soft cloth is I'm compressing those clay particles together so they're very tightly packed together. And you can start to see that there's a shine that's beginning to emerge. So though there's no glass involved here, we do get a very nice surface and was very helpful early on in uh, keeping uh, water from seeping through the terracotta uh, earthenware directly. Now this section is a lot of fun because this is what we consider fillers and aggregates. And if you remember, when I showed you that clay body earlier, that sculpture body that I said was really great with freeze and thaw temperatures, had a lot of strength to it, that kind of clay has something called grog added to it. And it really just looks like sand, doesn't it? It looks kind of like a beach sand. But what this is, is actually clay that's been fired and then pulverized back down and reintroduced to the clay body. So you can see here, we have grog in different mesh sizes, depending on what kind of texture you might like to see. And what's interesting is that when uh, you fire this type of additional material to the clay body, you will see evidence of it later on. So if you crack apart a piece, you will see that there are additions of another material on top of the clay. 
Even porcelain has a version of this and it's what we call malachite. And malachite is essentially porcelain fired and then pulverized back down. There are other materials that can be added into the clay. Um, sometimes you will see actual beach sand. And um, I would say in this case, we'll think about um, perhaps early potters uh, who are looking for local materials to add to their clay bodies for strength or to give it specific properties. We can see uh, crushed seashells, uh, which is actually a, um, uh, will deliver calcium, and calcium is a flux, as we've discussed, uh, even to the point of crushed granite. And this looks pretty chunky, so that would not be very uh, nice on the hands of a potter. We're now gonna move over to this section here. And this section has some more, um, uh, in some cases, easier to find if you were looking for something to add to your clay body. And early uh, uh, examples of pottery around this area uh, from colonists, you can dig up and you can see um, evidence of uh, eggshells that have been crushed down and added to. Uh, we have straw. We also have paper pulp. Uh, that would have, of course, come later, but paper pulp is a wonderful additive in that it uh, provides kind of a fibrous matrix within the clay body. This is nylon. That is now a, um, a contemporary version of the paper pulp. And then we have uh, sawdust or shavings of wood. Now, all of these additives are going to disappear after the firing. They're going to burn out. And therefore, we would not see evidence of these after firing, but we might see voids. We might see where they were. So that can be a clue if you're looking at a pottery sherd and you're uh, trying to see what would have been added to that clay. There are cases where individuals have done uh, experiments with trying to create porous clay bodies and uh, adding in organic materials such as rice or lentils or couscous, and those can be really fun to experiment with. The trick of this type of burnout uh, material is that you have to make sure you have enough clay to keep the whole structure together. If not, it will just crumble in your hands after it comes out of the kiln firing.